All right, Ted. Well, it is time, and we are welcoming back some special guests to the Fixed Stops Roundtable. That's right, Gene. It's finally time. So we want to welcome back our Master of Ceremonies, uh, Mr. Ben Price, and Thank our co-host for the event, Cara Delane. Ben and Cara, welcome back to the Fixed Stops Roundtable. Uh, it's awesome to be here, and uh, I feel excited. I feel like Tom Cruise again. Whew! I'm so excited. <laughs> I don't know if he's coming back later, but there's a few other guys coming back, so uh, stay tuned, and uh, I'm looking forward to some of your TED Talks as well, so that's going to be fun. <laughs> I love it. Well, you've yeah. brought a whole new element uh, to the to the Fixed Ops Roundtable in the last couple of conferences, Ben. So we're really happy to have you back. And Kara, we're excited to have you back. You're a social media icon for retail automotive. So, you know, congratulations on all the success you're having as well. Hey, I'm happy to be back. All right. So uh, without further ado, Kara, uh, who do we got coming up here in this next segment? Next, we've got Rob Leary of BG Products and Liza Borges, President and CEO of Carter Meyer Automotive. Okay, everyone. So as promised, our first TED Talk of the day, and that's what it's going to be, is with Rob Leary, the Director of Sales at BG Products. Uh, Rob is a great friend, as is BG of the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Rob, welcome back to the event. Hey, thanks, Ted. Glad to be back. Looking forward to this. You know, uh, the past several times we've done this where you presented a number of slides and we had uh, great feedback from the audience as well. And you talked on a number of topics. And of course, today's being the tire summit. So what Rob and I thought we would do everybody is make this more of a conversation as we kick off the tire summit today. So uh, Rob, I got a couple questions for you. If it's okay, I'm gonna fire away. Yeah, go ahead, shoot Ted. Okay, so from your perspective, why do you think dealers have such a difficult time in, in selling tires? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it really comes down to one reason. And I've heard you talk about it in the past in some of your seminars and it's really, about an inconsistent process and, and really not doing a proper walk around with the primary purpose of, of literally just checking tire tread depth on every customer. And when you, when you think about it, like at a minimum, they should be able to penetrate, or at least in my mind, at least 40% of those vehicles. I know that's kind of a thrown out there number, but if you just think about it from a warranty perspective, right? So we retain some 70% of the customers through the warranty, right? We all know that and we lose 70% of them post warranty. But at the end of the day, we should be able to retain at least 40% of that business in tires. And it, you also think about it, when you change tires, they change out at about 25 to 50,000 miles, depending on what kind of tires you're buying, whether you're buying low profile tires, which obviously wear out a little quicker or more of the robust tires that you want for more longer wear. But at the end of the day, that sounds about right to me but we're not even close to getting to that mark. I think the last one I saw penetration wise from a national average was around 11%. And, and that just flat out doesn't make sense. And I really think it just ties back to the fact that we're not doing the a proper walk around again with the simple purpose of doing uh, the tire tread depth. And, and the other thing I think about that, that really is another missed opportunity around the tire tire tread depth is, is that really gives you an opportunity to sell two more services that quite frankly are profitable, very profitable. And that is just simply doing alignments and or tire rotations, right? And, and I think that is part and parcel as to why we're not getting the tire business done and it's not being used as effectively as we could as a retention tool, right? And I, I tell advisors when I consult to them every time is that, hey, just because a customer came in for their first service at 3,000, 6,000, or even 10,000 doesn't mean you don't give the tire tread depth analysis and you don't do the proper walk around. And, and because when you do that, you build consistency, right? It's like the, the whole multi-point inspection process at green, green, yellow, and then red, right? The same holds true for people's tires. That if we do that consistently, and by the way, when we do that, and it doesn't come up as 430 seconds, which is the, the, the critical time to change out tires. When we don't do that, we simply tell the customer and we get the opportunity to tell the customer that, hey, tires look great today, but listen, as they begin to wear, we're gonna need to do some alignments. We might need to do some rotations, but when it comes time to replace those tires, know that we are your source. Know that we are competitive, 
There's my, my uh, price match guarantee for my tires. If you want to do that as a dealer, I recommend it. It might be a little bit of a loss leader in some cases or might just be there to retain that customer. But at the end of the day, it's a heck of a lot better to retain a customer through the lifetime of that tire versus trying to um, recapture that customer um, through other means down the road, either through marketing or trying to conquest another t- customer because you lost that service customer. And I think, well, I think at the end of the day, I was say one, yeah, I, I was going to just, just go back to something you just said. Yeah. You know, and you've mentioned it a couple of times, that key word consistency. Yeah. So the, the consistency is so important. And I know that, you know, part of that consistency is to have that consistent maintenance conversation with the customer, which yep. you at BG, there's nobody better at that than BG products at having that. Um, I'm just wondering how do, how would you how do you fit tires into into that equation? Yeah, it's a good question. We get that a lot, and I kind of start by telling a story that a study uh, that was done years ago by by an OEM, and quite frankly, it dates back to the t- 2000s. But a major OEM um, did this study, and again, I think it still makes sense uh, today. And they did it with Boston Consulting Group, which is you know, pretty high end consulting group, but they, they looked at ways to increase the dealer service business. And, um, and what they found was that the study concluded that 75% of maintenance customers serviced where they bought tires. And likewise, or maybe more importantly, that, that 78% of must of maintenance customers buy tires from the first person that recommends a tire purchase. And so I go back to that whole conversation of, when customers in the warranty, that's the best time to be selling them the tires because the study just revealed 78%, almost 80%, eight of a, out of 10 customers will buy from the first person that, that does it. But again, if we don't have that consistent process, then you know it's that whole idea of you don't ask, you don't get. Um, and that's really what I think drives that. And just as you do that with customers and you talk to them about the proper maintenance of their tires, that means inflation, uh, rotation, um, uh, and then alignments and all of that, as important as that is to tire maintenance, it also provides an opportunity to also talk about the other preventative maintenance items for their engine, for their fuel, for their transmission, for their driveline, for their brakes, for everything. And it really brings that, that conversation uh, to to power, if you will, um, and, and not to play on words, but J.D. Power and Associates did a study not, not too long ago, and I think, again, it still holds true today, and that is when we sell preventative maintenance, goodness happens. When we sell tires, goodness happens, especially in the retention side, but it also happens when we sell tires. We also know once we get that car up on the rack, we sell more service work right? Because it affords the opportunity to really begin to look at that vehicle, whether it be the brakes or again, the driveline or transmission, looking for leaks, et cetera. So it really provides an opportunity to provide sales and again, additional maintenance. So you don't think, and I think this is going to come up probably during the course of the day today, because we have a number of viewpoints on it. You know, there's not a big margin in tires. Um, There's a much big margin, uh, margin in preventative maintenance services that we can do. Do you think selling tires um, you know, negatively impacts that uh, preventative maintenance, you know, work? You know, I, I really don't think so. And and again, you know, maybe the average tire sale today is, you know, between let's call it low end $400 on the high end, maybe $1,200 and maybe some cases really high end 1800. But at the end of the day, I really don't think it's a problem because I, as a dealer, as a service director, or even as a, a ser- service consultant, I'm okay with selling that customer tires because I know 78% of the customers are going to be coming back, right? They're going to A, buy from me, but equally important, they're going to be coming back to do their next uh, service with me. So I'm okay with that. And then if I've got confidence in my team to do the proper inspection with related maintenance items, so that means the technician, even though he's doing the tires, he's also teeing up Maybe it's the next service maintenance. Maybe we don't have to get it done when we're selling the tires today, but we'll get an opportunity because we know that customer is going to come back. Then we can talk about the preventative maintenance on their next visit. So I think it provides an opportunity, again, as long as we're doing the proper processes and inspections, we will get the next opportunity. And that's the beauty of it. You know, speaking of what you said on the retail side, have you seen any successful programs that tie, um, let's say, tires and maintenance to uh 
the service retention and, and, and then even the next vehicle purchase. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I, a buddy of mine who uh, bought a, he was actually, he worked for Ford Motor Company and I can't remember how he got this one done, but he actually bought a Subaru dealership on the East coast and in the North. And, uh, he was a phenomenal guy, did, did some really, I think, creative programs. And, and he did a, a program initially to kind of help build up a trustworthy used car business, but it was all built around tires. And the, the idea was simple, right? If a customer purchased a car and took the deal and took the car to his dealership for all of its services, right? That means he would know everything about that vehicle. And when he came to take it in his trade, he could say that, say that was a value app for the customer, could give him a, maybe a better value for the trade. But equally important, he could have the confidence that he knew all the maintenance records on that vehicle. And in doing so, he would provide the customer with uh, tires for life. That means they, they would literally, if they did up to $2,000 of maintenance with them, he would give them tires for life. And it was a payoff for him because he got great retention. And when he did that, when he did that, he literally saw about 30 to 40% better retention than all the other Subaru dealers across the country. And it was just that little remarkable thing that he did. But, but the thing that he did equally important, Ted and, and team was, is that that gave him the confidence because he knew he could retain those customers. He was already proving it, but he also knew that he needed to do more than just sell tires. He needed, he needed to, to, as you indicated, sell some profitable work and that's where the maintenance came in and this guy did a phenomenal job not only just the poor ends that that we talked about last month but he really did an incredible job on all the uh, major services again brake trainee drive line power steering back then of course uh, and the like and so it really does provide an opportunity to sell additional services and getting creative around that i think is is the key to doing that you know here we are on the morning of october 23rd and we are in the heart of something that was that goal at Google a little bit later today is going to refer to as tire season. We're in tire season, Rob. And during tire yeah. season, kicking off now in October and then going into Veterans Day in November and into the holidays, into December and January and so on, you know, tires start to really, you know, come top of mind. Uh, at the last two sessions, you spoke about the service kiosk. I don't know if you re recall. And turning dealer oil change t turning that business into a profit generating oil changes through the poor ends. Mm -hmm. um you have an update for our audience on those two yeah. yeah absolutely ted yeah um and that's great this is tire awareness month let's call it as well right i like it yeah um yeah and so on our smart bma self-service kiosk front um we're excited to announce that we're actually going to pilot with multiple stores in mid-November, so super excited about that. And we're gonna focus more on the express side of the service, at least in our initial launch. And then uh, we'll focus primarily actually on the subject matter that I spoke about last month, which is really that poor in business, turning a, a loss leader oil change business into a profitable oil change business. So we're, we're really excited about the smart, uh, uh, smart VMA self-service kiosk, but it won't just be for express service. We will enable it also to provide a full menu of services in a good, better, best format where it's fully vindicated and provide a full maintenance. So all your 30, 60, 90 K services will be in there as well if the dealer so wishes. So we're really excited about that. And then on the, on the poor ends front, again, taking that, that loss leader oil change business and making it profitable, man, we are seeing a huge uptick in that in terms of our smart VMA digital menu side of that business. And um, it's it's really turned some heads in our industry. In fact, um, we've got that many more dealerships coming on, but we're literally piling it in one of the larger de de uh, largest dealership groups in, in the nation. And we're pi piloting it in one of their markets and they're already seeing huge success, not only in just the motor oil additives, but also the fuel additives. So um, that's pretty exciting for us and um, uh, it's going extremely well. BG so Products has an amazing reputation in the business based on trust. And um, I read somewhere, and I think I heard recently that BG Rob has 53% of the market. And that is just yeah. an incredible statistic. Rob, nobody has 53% of any market. All right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, continued success to you, you know, on that. And, um, you know, BG is leading the way because you're innovative with so many things. Now, if, if dealers are interested, 
in learning more about how they can drive maintenance uh, through a tire program or want more information on the, uh, the self-service kiosk or your new uh, profitable oil change program, uh, who do they contact? Well, um, as you pointed out, we have 53% of the dealer market, but about another 30% of the independent market. But um, they can call any of our 800 plus distributor uh, reps uh, throughout the country um, or just call on the distributor itself. Or they can always contact me direct uh, at 513-240-5689 or at rleary at bgprod.com. I see your numbers up here on the screen. So we took the liberty uh -huh. to put that up. In case anybody, you just want to go straight to the top right, and, and talk to Rob directly. And um, Rob, just amazing success. And, you know, it all starts with the, with the tires and with the consistency and with the belief in preventative maintenance services and the coaching and training. So all the great stuff that BG products provide. So we want to thank you for being here. And if it's all right, if you'd remain behind in the chat, because I'm sure we're going to have some questions in the Q&A uh, from our audience uh, to be able to go ahead and interact with our uh, audience there. And also, Rob is in the virtual event program, everybody. You can contact his, him there as well, his contact information, and it's linked right back to uh, his email and to the site as well. Rob Leary, BG Products here at the Fix Ops Roundtable. Hey, thanks again, Ted. Thanks, Gene. Well, Ted, it's always great to hear from Rob Leary. And now our morning keynote speaker. That's right, Gene. Liza Borges is the president and CEO of Carter Myers Automotive. Carter Myers Automotive consists of 16 dealerships and 17 brands. In the year 2019, they retailed 15,000 vehicles. Liza Borges is also the recipient of the Best Practice Award here and a great friend of the Fix Ops Roundtable. Liza, welcome back to the Fix Ops Roundtable. Thank you so much, Ted. I'm, I'm really honored to be here this morning. I wish we could be together in person, but hopefully that'll be happening again soon. You know, we had that opportunity earlier this year at uh, one of our events, and uh, that, that opportunity will come again. But yeah, look at all the things that have arisen, though, the new opportunities for us in the retail land, and it shows how resilient the dealer body is, you know, with how we've responded to COVID. So uh, with that, Liza, I'll ask you to take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Ted. So I'm gonna jump right into it this morning. I'm so excited to see all of you all virtually. As Ted and I were chatting, hopefully we'll be back together in person soon. But in the meantime, it's never been a more important time for us to share ideas across our industry. So as we kick off the Fixed Ops Roundtable this morning, I really wanted to focus the uh, keynote presentation on the culture that we are creating, growing and instilling in our dealerships so that as we learn the great processes and these new ideas throughout the roundtable today, we're going to be better prepared to execute. Without the right culture in your dealership, it doesn't matter how many great new ideas that we have or how much technology we install or how beautiful our facilities are. I'm going to start our day talking about how to create a win-win culture in your dealership. In this lifetime, you've been raised since you were little to understand that for somebody to win, someone else has to lose. Any Dodgers fans out there? In order for the Dodgers to win the World Series this year, the Rays will have to lose. Now, I'm not about to ask if there are any Trump fans or Biden fans, but in order for one to win the presidential election, the other must lose. And for many decades, there has been a perception that either the dealership is winning or the customer is winning, but not always both. And I'm here to tell you that if you want to win in the automotive industry, if ever you are going to win, we have to change the reality and the perception of who is winning through our daily actions. My personal philosophy and coupled with the vision and the mission of our company, CMA, is all about not who we beat, but how many winners we create. The word win is thrown, ar thrown around a lot. And many times it's in very appropriate ways. We all want people in our organization who want to win, right? But it can also hurt our growth if we focus on winning alone. For many years, our industry has had a negative stigma associated to it. That sometimes a dealership is all about winning. And this idea has occasionally been tied to stories of dealerships making a huge gross on one customer or being sold work that was not needed sometimes not having clear, understandable pay plans that are fair to associates and more. There are some people in our industry who are 
sometimes embarrassed to say that this is their career, or they lead by saying, I wasn't planning on being in the car business. Now, I'm sure that this doesn't apply to this group, but nobody should feel the need to apologize for what we do. And in addition, sometimes we do a disservice ourselves by bashing other dealers or our own industry as a whole. Our industry is too great and too important for any of these perceptions to exist. I'm here to talk to you today about the incredible impact that each one of us, and even more so collectively, can have on thousands or hundreds of thousands of people across this country if we take a different approach to our business. If we can focus on every action every day on how we create win-win situations for our customers, for our fellow associates, and for our communities, we can impact lives. We can create pride for this incredible industry that we're all a part of, and we can really make a difference in this world. So as Ted shared, I'm Liza Borchus, and I'm the president and CEO of Carter Myers Automotive. I graduated from the University of Virginia. I got to put up a little go who's because I think technically since there wasn't a NCAA basketball championship last year, the who's are still the reigning champs. So I went to work for American Honda Motor Company after college out in Torrance, California. And at that time, I didn't have a desire to be in the retail side of the business. Actually, it was never a discussion in my household. My father was the third generation of our family to run the business and had three dealerships at the time. However, after six years with American Honda, which was a fantastic company to work for, by the way, during the end of my career with them, I spent three days in a leadership training conference with one of the Honda dealers that I called on at the time. Their entire executive team, general managers, general sales managers, service directors, all got together and spent three days learning, growing, creating action plans and goals for their teams. I left after three days so pumped up, just like many of you all are gonna leave this conference today, and I drove back to my home office and I felt a void. I realized I didn't have a great way to use all of the information that I had just learned. I worked for a great company, but I worked out of my home office and in other people's dealerships where I didn't feel that I had much of an opportunity to make an impact. I was really comfortable, I was making a good living, but as we all know, you're most comfortable right before you die. And at age 27, I certainly wasn't ready to die. So I needed to get out of my comfort zone. I shared my thoughts with Pete, who's now my husband. And for the first time, it was really clear to me that I wanted to be a part of a dealership. I wanted to help find solutions for customers, create a great workplace for associates and put down roots in a community. So real quick, the next month, Pete and I went down to Charlottesville, met with my dad. He shared with me that there was a Volvo dealer in town looking to sell his dealership and retire. I met the dealer in the back booth of a McDonald's and put together a letter of intent to buy his dealership on a napkin. Within 72 hours, we sold our house in Annapolis, put a contract on a house in Charlottesville and gave notice at our jobs. Now, I'm gonna tell you something that I haven't shared with many people. You can see this picture of that little bitty Volvo dealership. I was about to embark on a new chapter of my life and I felt a little bit embarrassed and a little bit guilty. I had not come into the family business right away because I was determined to prove that I could have success without it being given to me. i had been incredibly lucky my whole life. I was born to two amazing parents. In fact, my mom, she's a saint, she's an angel, the most kind person I've ever met. My dad has been a coach and a mentor and has led by example with an incredible work ethic. And I have an awesome sister who uh, just had her first baby last week and she works at a dealership down in Florida. Now, sure, we had challenges. Our family business almost went bankrupt in the early 90s, and there was a saying in our house that six cars a day kept the banker away. But overall, I can't complain. I had a pretty darn wonderful childhood, and I was now being given the opportunity to run and own a dealership that, yes, I had invested my savings, and I took out some personal debt so that I could own 20% of it, and our family holding company uh, did invest the rest. I had never run a dealership. I had never really managed a person I was 28 years old, and as you can see by this picture, I looked like I was 15. I stood in front of the group of associates at Herb Brown Volvo as Mr. Brown announced that he was selling his store to me, and I was scared to death. Now, I wasn't scared because I lacked the confidence to think that I could run the dealership. I really believed in myself, but I was really scared because I stared out at this group of associates, all of whom were older than I was, all of whom were men with the exception of two, our receptionist and our warranty administrator. I knew that they were staring at me thinking that this was some silly girl whose dad gave her a dealership and I was determined to prove them wrong. First couple of months, I did what anybody would do. 
I simply worked harder than anybody else. That's what you do when you own a business and you're trying to prove yourself. I was there before sunrise, well after sunset. I was jumping in and driving the shuttle. I was selling the cars. I was stocking the parts. But there was a lot of tension in the air. I wasn't connecting with the team. My small sales staff both resigned on the same day, and I was told that my service staff was all about to resign. I stayed up all night trying to come up with a plan on what to do. When I arrived the next morning, a little before 6 a.m., I came in with the mission that I wanted every single associate of that dealership who was willing to stick with me to wake up a year from then and thank their lucky stars that I had bought the dealership and joined their team. I realized super quickly that no matter how hard I worked, if I didn't focus on creating winners with me and around me, we were all gonna fail. I needed to help each of them succeed. I needed to create a vision of our future to, together. It couldn't just be my vision. Otherwise I was wasting my time. So where I focused first was with the technicians. This was one job that I knew I couldn't do. And I quickly recognized that if they were energized and saw a bright future, the rest of our team would follow. We had plenty of work coming in our dealership. That service department was full, but we lacked urgency in getting it done. We weren't communicating properly with customers when their cars had to stay overnight. We weren't finding any new ways to create efficiency. We were simply doing things the way that they had always been done. So I jumped in, I started pulling cars in the shop to get techs on the next job quicker, pulling them out, doing quality test drives, running parts to our technicians, grabbing repair orders off of the advisor's desks to help them get more approvals on the work. And most importantly, I started calling every single service customer the day after they were in for service to see how we could improve. And while I was focused on showing our technicians how invested I was in their future, I also accidentally learned how to run a service department. And pretty quickly, our dealership came together and the results showed on the bottom line. This was the beginning. So now, fast forward 15 years, our company has grown up, mostly right after the 2008 recession, when we saw other dealers ready to get out. 2008 was tough. Any of you all who were, were in the business at that time know how hard it was. Many dealers didn't wanna work that hard and decided it was time to sell and retire at that point. It was our opportunity at CMA to grow. We added 11 stores in 10 years. And at the moment, we have 16 dealerships, 17 brands, we're in six markets with a little over 700 associates. And I still wake up every single day knowing that my purpose is to create as many winners and win-win relationships as I can. I wanna do that personally and through our company. And I often think, how many people can I help to wake up every single day feeling as lucky as I feel in life? You know, our industry gives us all an opportunity to impact more lives than we ever realize. Collectively, we touch millions of customers a year. In new car sales alone, we touched over 17 million families in 2019. We sold over 14 million used cars as franchise dealers. And I don't know the number of service customers, but it would be a multiple of those two combined. So let's say billions. We employ approximately 2 million and help support their families. And we impact thousands of communities. We need to take this responsibility seriously and with pride. I'm gonna to talk to you today about how we create win-wins in three areas, our customers, our associates, and our communities. We always talk about how buying a vehicle is the second largest purchase that people make. After what? Buying a home, right? But the reality is, is that it is arguably the most important purchase and asset in their lives. Because without a safe, reliable car, people could not do the things that are critical to enjoying a happy and rewarding life. They cannot go and experience their dreams. The purchase of the vehicle is one thing, but keeping it safe, maintained, and reliable is just as important. People can't get to and from their jobs to pay for that house or put food on the table without a reliable vehicle. We can't get our kids to a doctor's appointment, to school, to a friend's house, to a tutor, or to soccer practice. Cars provide the freedom to visit family as much or as little as you might want. An ailing father, a wedding in another state, a niece's dance recital across town. Cars deliver the ability to enjoy life, date nights, movies, dinners, shopping, church. At least it did before COVID. And since COVID hit, cars have become an even, an even higher demand as people feel less comfortable with all other modes of travel and shared transportation. 
The number one way that we can create win-wins for our customers is to change our thinking about what we're trying to accomplish with each interaction. Our job is not to help a customer buy or service a vehicle. Our mission is to help customers get where they want to go in life. We're going to interact every day with different customers. One day we're going to have a customer who wants to purchase the highest performance vehicle that we sell. And they might want us to install some aftermarket software to increase performance, change out the brakes to ceramic. They love the rush of driving and the energy that's generated from taking a luxury vehicle down the road. Another day, we're gonna have a customer who might need us to help and find them a new vehicle because they've got twins on the way and they need to fit their growing family into a larger vehicle, but they only have $390 a month budget, or maybe that's what they've been approved for. And they really need a vehicle that has a very low cost of ownership and future potential repairs and maintenance because they need more money for diapers. And tomorrow, another customer will visit us in our service department because they simply need their vehicle repaired because it keeps breaking down on them, causing them to be late to work and putting their job in jeopardy. We need to change our culture to think about not how many cars we each need to get over the curb this month or how many hours we must turn in the shop, but how many people can we find solutions for every day? When we do this, repeat and referrals will happen in our showrooms and our service departments exponentially, and we will hit the numbers and the goals that we've set. It becomes a win-win. In the service department, what if we changed our thinking from how many hours per RO were sold to how many problems per RO were solved for this customer? Instead of focusing on how many hours we turn, we need to focus on how safe, reliable, and well-maintained we can make each car. It doesn't mean that we don't track hours. We still reward high performers. Profit is a measure of how well we take care of a customer. When we ask the right questions, help prior prioritize for customers and help them make good decisions for the future life of their vehicle, we create great value. And when we create great, great value, we deserve to make a profit. Quick example, is it truly a win if you have a service advisor who averages two and a half hours per repair order, but when looking deeper sells the same five recommended services or repairs to every customer? Even worse, if these are tied to some sort of spiff is the advisor truly advising the customer on which repairs or maintenance items are the highest priority? Instead of advising the customer that maybe they need a new set of tires today, that that's the highest priority because they're barely passing state inspection, the advisor might be able might end up selling a uh, brake fluid flush, a power steering flush, and an alignment for the same cost to the customer. But maybe it isn't what was best for the customer that day. Unconsciously, there might have been more labor in one versus another. This does happen, unfortunately it happened to us, and it wasn't anyone who was intentionally making bad decisions, but they were driven by uh, something other than making a win-win for a customer. It was someone who we thought was a high performer who ultimately ended up hurting us long-term. But we're often put in positions in service where we need to help a customer create a plan and prioritize repairs within a budget. When we ask really good questions, understand what the customer is trying to accomplish, and be a partner with them in the solution, both for today and for their next several service visits, that's when we create a loyal raving fan who trusts us and considers us a partner in their transportation solution. Now, this isn't something new, it's all stuff that we know, but do we always take the time to make sure it's happening in our dealerships? We will get the gross, the hours, in fact, more of it, if we focus on finding the best solutions for every customer and creating a true win-win just by changing our language, we're shifting the culture in our dealerships. The second area that we need win-wins is for our associates. The auto industry employs over 2 million people across this country. A lot of us didn't plan to be in the car business, yet we impact more people's lives than anyone else, more than most industries. Our sales associates and service advisors interact with more people than almost any other industry. This is a serious job. There are so many ways that we can create win-wins for our associates and coworkers. And I wish I had you know, hours to talk about them with you all today. The majority of people in our industry don't always seek out automotive as a career. And I, if I could go into more of that, uh, I would. And we're gonna talk a little bit about it on our panel and how we continue to recruit. But here are the two key things I am gonna talk to you about. Creating win-wins for our associate. Number one, sharing success beyond a paycheck. Too many people live paycheck to paycheck and have no plans for retirement. Our mission as a company is to help our 700 associates create financial stability and a future retirement that they deserve to enjoy one day. 
Every year I challenge myself to try to find and understand one more challenge or friction area that our associates feel in their everyday lives that we could address to support them. Through this thinking, a couple things we've done over the last few years, we changed our health plan to being self-insured and made a commitment that every dollar saved by us making good decisions on our health care will go to offset their future premiums for all of our associates. We also invested in a financial wellness course that provides them with online classes and financial advisors to help them maybe with buying their first home or setting up 529 plans. But this past year, I wanna share with you a little bit more detail about the initiative that we started. This was actually an idea from one of our own associates. Um, we started the CMA Moving Lives Forward Scholarship Program. It's open to the kids of all of our associates who are looking to attend a technical school, a community college, or a four-year college. They can apply for a scholarship to cover a portion of their tuition. And let me tell you where the real win-win happened. We've always done a nice donation in the name of each long-term retiring associate from CMA. We would either donate, uh, make a contribution to the NADA Charitable Foundation or to a local nonprofit. But starting last year, we decided to honor these retirees by establishing a scholarship in their name to support the kids of our current associates. For example, we had a long-term service manager who was then a fleet manager retire after 35 years at the end of 2019. We created a scholarship in his name and his honor, specifically to a student who will be attending a technical school. And the student will receive up to $2,500 per year towards their tuition. And this will happen every year in perpetuity in Bob Owen's honor. This creates a win-win. Honoring a long-term associate, helping with the financial burden of our current associate, and hopefully grooming a future potential associate. Now, the largest win-win that we create for our associates is for their future retirement. It may not work for every company, but I hope that by my sharing this for just two minutes will spark your creativity to help figure out what your win-win is. When I joined CMA, there was a strong foundation for creating win-win partnerships. We've had an ESOP, an employee stock ownership plan for over 40 years. 10% of our after-tax profits are contributed each year to our associates through the ESOP, ESOP. The more success our company has, the more contributions is made, the more stock each associate earns, and the stock price increases. As you can see, we've had quite a bit of increase over the years. It's a bit complicated to explain in just a few minutes, but we all know that financial stability and retirement savings are a major problem in our country today. So as we work through our ESOP, one of our, out of our top 50 stockholders in the company, more than half of them have never been in management. A lot of them are technicians, service advisors, a couple from our recon departments. And this team has stuck with us, contributed significantly, and performed over the years. Carl Solo, he started with us as a technician at the age of 17, and he's the fourth largest stockholder in our company. Beth Blaylock, uh, Beth has worked with us in the accounting office for over 40 years, packaging deals, doing title work, and any other duty she was asked to do. Beth is now the 10th largest stockholder in our company. And Simona Holloway, Simona has been finding solutions for our customers' transportation needs in our showroom for over 35 years. Actually, I think 35 is this year for her. And um, Simona is our 12th largest stockholder in the company. Psychology tells us that people take care of the things that they own. Our associates own 26% of our company and our general managers each own up to 20% of the dealerships that they run. Creating an ESOP may not be the solution for your company, or you might be a part of a larger company. But I challenge you to think about what win-win can you create to share the success beyond just a paycheck. The second way I wanna talk about uh, creating win-wins for our associates is to intentionally create a diverse team of all genders, races, ages, and most importantly, diversity of ideas. I've spoken previously at the Fixed Ops Roundtable on what we need to do to hire more women. And you can see a lot of them up on this picture here today but specifically not just in dealerships, but in our fixed ops departments. I'm gonna quickly recap a few of those ideas here. They're relevant to not only hiring women, but how we bring in new ideas to our industry. The first thing is we can't depend on simply posting a job. We have to be recruiting through relationships, referrals, and reputation. It's a win-win if our existing associates help recruit our new team members. The last thing our team wants is to refer us an applicant who's not a hard worker, who doesn't fit our culture, who's negative or doesn't have the right skill set. Our current team knows that their future is brighter if they help bring in strong players around them. 
I'll tell you, over the last six months, we've been uh, consistently hiring 75 to 80 percent of the associates in our company have had a previous relationship with us through a referral of an existing associate, a customer or maybe from the vendor side. The other thing I'll mention is that last year, only 3% of our total applications for parts and service were women. So if we want them, we must go find them. And one of the best ways is to tell your story, share it on social media, let them see the diversity of your dealership, create a buzz, get people talking about how they want to come work at your dealership. The second thing we have to do, and I'm looking at a lot of the, the women on the screen, is we've got to rethink the skill sets that are required for a job in our fixed ops departments. Now, maybe in the technician side, they do need to have technical aptitude and some skill, but what can't you teach? You can't teach likability, trust, work ethic, the ability to connect with customers and personal accountability. We can teach technology and, and computer programs and even mechanical knowledge. So let's look for what we, don't, what we can't teach. Many women don't apply because they read our job descriptions and they think they have to have three years of experience, DMS knowledge, technical aptitude, all that stuff that we put in our job postings. Let's change the wording on that and rethink the skill sets that we're looking for. And then also within the same areas, let's recognize the talent that's already within our organization. We had a lot of success promoting cashiers and receptionists and administrative support folks into high performing service advisors and service managers. I look forward to continuing to try to grow the number of women and the amount of diversity we have in our actual shops on the technician side. But when we create a diverse team, here's why it's a win-win. It's gonna help not only each individual grow, but it challenges traditional thinking. It brings a new lens to our industry and to our dealerships and to our departments. And just as important, it's a win because it opens up a part of the employment market that isn't even considering automotive right now, namely a high percentage of women. So it creates a win-win for our whole team if we intentionally focus on creating a diverse workforce within our dealerships. The last area of creating win-wins is for our communities. All of us give back in so many ways. In fact, car dealers are often sponsoring more in a community than almost any other industry. A few years ago, I decided that I wanted our contributions to go even further to create a larger win-win, to be more intentional and more impactful. So quick story, as we all know, there are people in every one of our communities who live in poverty, who are underemployed or unemployed and depend on social services and community support. We did a study led by United Way and Network to Work in one of our markets and determined exactly how many families needed assistance to become self-sufficient or financially stable without government support. We then studied what the main contributing factors were to hindering these families from reaching um, their goals. Transportation and childcare were the two main reasons. People couldn't hold steady employment because of lack of childcare or a lack of reliable transportation. They didn't have transportation either because their vehicle broke down and they didn't have the money to fix it, or they needed a vehicle and they couldn't get a loan due to such damaged credit. Now, where our dealerships are, we're not in major metros, so using public transportation is not a good option for most families. Our dealerships and our industry have a really unique opportunity. We have technicians, we have access to service facilities, to parts, and for loans, we have access to banking relationships where we can use our resources to make an incredible dent in the poverty cycle and contribute even more to our nonprofits than we ever have before. If we combine our unique automotive skills and experience with our dollars and volunteer time, and we focus it on transportation needs in our communities, the impact could be huge. So we decided to take action. In 2020, in the midst of uh, right before COVID started, we started a nonprofit called Driving Lives Forward. And how it works is we collaborate with four other nonprofits in this particular market to identify those families where transportation may be the one thing holding them back from their next step in life. Through our program, our nonprofit in collaboration with CMA, our company, helps to provide vehicle repairs, maintenance, and collateral for auto loans. Our associates are able to contribute through donations that we match, or they can donate their time to work on a vehicle. It's made us a stronger team, made a larger impact than we ever could with a single contribution of dollars, and it's filling a gap that was a real need in our community to try to fight poverty and help other families all around us. 
our associates feel more a part of our philanthropy now. They see the families who bring in their vehicle uh, for repairs through our program. They deliver the car to the family, as you see on this picture, who just got their loan approved through our program. They help raise money and contribute personally along with our customers to assist with fuel costs and other transportation needs. Driving Lives Forward is one of the best examples of a win-win-win relationship for our customers, our associates, and our community. Now, we still support many of the same nonprofits you saw on that last slide, but with each one of them, we figured out how do we tie transportation needs in with the families that they serve so that we can tie our company mission together with the needs of our community. Our mission and vision at Carter Myers Automotive is that we are owners who just do more. And the reason we do it is to move lives forward for our customers, our associates, and our communities. And it would be really easy for us to hold this mission tight to our chest and make it only about our company. But it's not about us beating other car dealerships or other dealership groups. It's all about how many we can convince to join us. What we do together matters. Our industry is important to our customers' lives, to the economy of our country, and to the futures of our 2 million associates and their families. We need to leave here, leave this conference today with pride and take our responsibility for our customers, our associates, and our communities seriously. So let me close by asking, how many winners can we create together? Liza Borges, moving lives forward. What an amazing story, your story, and the story of, of Carter Myers and the work that you're doing for your, your customers, your associates, and the community as well. Uh, thank you so much on behalf of the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Um, it just resonates with everybody. And thanks also for your commitment to the uh, dealers versus cancer cause that we have here at the Fixed Ops Roundtable. We're committed to raising $50,000 uh, for the uh, Dealers versus Cancer Challenge, the uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation. Uh, everybody, if you would, um, give today, send an email to dealersvcancer at dealerlaw.com. Len Belavia at Belavia Blatt is spearheading spear, uh, that operation. So thank you again for that. Thank you, Liza. Well, Kara, that was pretty amazing. Liza is a, a huge proponent of women in retail automotive, and she not just walks the talk, but she actually does it at her dealership with a lot of the initiatives that they do. So we're so glad to have her back at the Fixed Stops Roundtable. I think this is like the fourth time that she's been back to speak. Wow, she seems like an amazing woman. She is, and uh, you know, speaking of amazing women, uh, we have an, a panel coming up shortly. But before we do that. Let's bring back our master of ceremonies, Mr. Ben Price. Hello. Look where I am, guys. <laughs> I'm in the White House. I'm getting very excited about this. I feel great, by the way. I'm everybody's favorite president, and I'm uh, well medicated. I've got they, they, nobody's seen this stuff. It's invisible. Look at that. I can drink this stuff. Nobody knows. <laughs> what, what is that you're drinking, Mr. President? I feel, I feel very good. I feel positive. I feel very positive in these testing times. I really do. I feel great. <laughs> And I feel like a new man, and so does uh, my wife, Melania. So, But Liza's great, too, and she's fantastic. I really like – nobody does it li like Liza. Dear Liza. <laughs> well, Mr. President, we're so glad that you recovered and that you're, you're back with us again at the Fixed Ops Roundtable. Uh, you were a big hit at the last event. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I love the roundtable. Let's do this. <laughs> All right. Kara, uh, who do we have uh, coming up next? Up next, we have the keynote panel moderated by Liza Borges. Then after that, we've got the Tire Summit panel moderated by David Boyle and Tire Profiles. Great. Let's do it. At Pike Place Fish Market, you'll see lots of flying fish. But we saw more. Great customer service. Teamwork. Energy and results. So how can you bring this kind of energy to your organization? The answers are in FISH, the most watched training video in the world. The FISH philosophy is a fresh, powerful training solution. It has four easy to use practices. They help you create an environment where people love to come to work. One fish flying to Deborah. One fish flying to And so FISH, really lights people's hearts on fire. It helps them understand, hey, it's, 
it's up to me. And then it shows them a very simple, predictable pathway. So we all need ways to get pumped up and get re-motivated and refocused on what it means to really work together. Checking bags. How you doing, sir? What you Nearly every industry uses the fish philosophy to deliver amazing customer service. How's it going? Improve teamwork and trust. The more we incorporate the fish philosophy in what we do, the better job we do and the better our patients do. It has absolutely transformed the climate of our school. Our discipline problems have gone down dramatically. The businesses that I see use fish invariably end up the first choice, not just for the customers that they serve, but for people who want to work there. You build great environments where people want to come to work and where people say, that's the business that I want to do business with. Contact us to learn how the fish philosophy will help you. Do you have a great product you want to get in front of auto dealers across the country, and specifically their fixed ops departments? You know their service, parts, and body shop? For over 15 years, Fixed Ops Magazine has been putting service-related products like yours in front of franchise auto dealers across the country. There simply is no better way to reach every dealer in the USA all at once. Hi, I'm Ron, the publisher of Fixed Ops Magazine, which is both a digital at fixedopsmag.com and print magazine that reaches out to over 38,000 subscribers who influence what products are purchased in the over 16,000 dealers across the country. Fixed Ops Magazine may even publish your article about a topic you are an expert and have a real passion for in this industry. Every article has the author's contact info so they can reach you. Write an article, run an ad, and an e-blast. We call that our bundle for success. You won't believe how great a deal it is. So to get started, call, text, or email me and I'll tell you more. We are 100% devoted to the franchise stores so we don't waste your time or money. We are laser focused on your prospects. Fixed Ops Magazine, the number one way to get your product in front of auto dealers today. www.fixedopsmag.com Ron at fixedopsmag.com 714-803-5476 Fixed Ops Magazine, the number one way to get your product in front of auto dealers today. Welcome back to the Fixed Ops Roundtable, everyone. I'm Gene Girdley along with Ted Ings. And Ted, our last speaker, is also here joining us now to moderate this panel. Gene, uh, Liza Borges is the president and CEO of Carter Myers Automotive, and we're so grateful to have her here with us today. Now, about to lead a panel uh, to follow up on her keynote that she just delivered. So Liza, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and let you introduce everybody who's here with us today. Thanks so much, Ted. You know, I love sharing a lot of my ideas with you all during the keynote uh, presentation on how to create a win-win culture in our dealerships and our fixed ops departments. But I know that there are so many more ideas out there, certainly than I have or than our group has. And I'm incredibly honored to have four automotive superstars join me for this discussion so that we can talk a little bit deeper on how we're setting up win-wins and creating that culture in our dealerships and for the future of our industry. So a quick uh, introduction of our panel. Um, let me start with, right, at least on my screen next to me, Adam Ahrens is the dealer of Patriot Auto Group. We have Shauna Corsali, who recently joined CMA as the Director of Operations at CMA's Colonial Auto Center. We have Heidi Withrow, who is a service advisor at Group One Automotive, and Sarah Van Tyne, the BDC Director for Scott Clark Automotive. Um, so excited to be here with you guys today and can't wait to hear some of the ideas that you're going to be able to share with us. So I thought to kick us off, um, we would start by really having you all uh, a little bit chime in on some of the topics that I just talked about the last 25 minutes, but to share your perspective. And I'd love to sit back and take a few notes this time. So um, as we focus on culture, let's start with um, Adam, actually. I'd love to hear one idea that you have that you could share with us that you've implemented in your dealership to create a win-win 
with your associates that's increased engagement and connection. Even better if it's in the fixed ops area. Oh, thank you. And, and thank you for, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you. And thank you for having me this morning. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's required for a win-win is to let everybody know where they fit in. So everybody should know the goals of the dealership, where you're tracking in every department. And so what we've done is we've shared things that used to just be done in a sales department with the service department and the parts department and things that were just done in the service department and the parts department with the sales department. So that everybody knows where we're going and how they fit in to get there. And then we go to the utmost transparency, which is if anybody in the dealership wants to attend a financial statement meeting, they're all welcome. And that doesn't mean just the managers. And by the way, it is an overwhelming thing, but you will get some engagement and people asking questions of how you get there. And I will tell you that one of the things that we share with all of our associates and with their family members who want to join us um, as far as getting engaged with us is we share profitability. The worst thing you could probably do is go sign up for a company that's losing money. It creates different behaviors. So everybody in the organization should know that you're profitable. Their family should know that you're profitable. And, and does it create some questions? Absolutely. But I don't think they're upset that the dealership makes money, especially when you reinvest it in your people, in your facility, and continue to grow your organization. Well, you're spot on. And one of the things that I mentioned earlier was that profit is the measure of the value that we create for our customers. It's not a bad word when we're doing it in a way to create value. So I think it's great. And the teams know that they're doing a good job if the customers want to come back and do business with us. Right. That's awesome. Thanks, Adam. You're welcome. Sarah, would you mind chiming in on that same question? One thing that your dealer group has done to increase engagement and create a win-win for your associates, your customers, and the dealership group as a whole. Thank you, Liza. So I would definitely like to speak about the business development department specifically because a lot of what we've crafted with our pay plan in the department actually spurs all of those things on for every other department in our group. So one thing that I uh, became aware of many, many years ago as a business development director was that the call center can be a really grueling job for an individual. And so what happens a lot of time is you hire somebody, you spend all this effort and, and energy training them. And then a few years later, they get incredibly burned out. And it's just because they don't see an upward a momentum as far as their career. Um, you know, they don't have the, the option to, to really be promoted to uh, to a role unless they there is an opening as like BDC manager or BDC director. And the perception is that they're kind of boxed in. And especially when you get a larger business development center, when you start to get into, you know, 20 people or more, that, that really becomes a problem for a rep to really stay focused because they, the, the perception is that there is no nowhere to go in the organization. So one of the things that we did with our pay structure is we crafted a pay plan where all of our reps have the ability to promote themselves within the department. And we rank the reps by, uh, by their productivity, their appointment conversion, their inbound uh, and outbound conversion on appointments uh, and their call handling. And so what happens in that environment is we have ranks zero to five. Uh, and then we also have a team manager uh, level as well, where someone, we have two spots open as far as uh, people being able to, to be promoted into a management position. But what it's done by having those levels within the, the department from zero to five, we have higher pay structures for the people that are at the higher ranks. So what it does is it creates a, an environment where the rep feels like they're, they matter and that the production that they're doing, they can see the results and they can see what they're driving towards. I'll say in our department, over half of the individuals in the department are at the upper tiers of the pay plan. And the great thing about that too is it helps drive retention. So every single month we're very transparent and I review the, the performance from the previous month. We have one-on-ones with every single rep and we talk about their goals. We talk about, all right, so do you want to push for the next level? Um, how can we help you maintain your level? Are there things that you're, you're interested in learning more about? 
And so being able to have that just within the call center, what it does is it creates an environment where the rep really cares about the phone calls that they're taking. They really start pushing uh, the appointments. They try to really work hard to, to get the appointments for, um, you know, to move up in, in rank. And they are very mindful of the quality of the phone calls and the customer service they're delivering. That in turn really helps our service department and our sales departments out because when the reps are really engaged, it creates a wonderful customer experience. The customers are satisfied. They enjoy, um, you know, the attention and that interaction the rep provides. Then when the customer comes in, the advisor, you know, has a customer that's already aware of what's going on and what to expect when they arrive at the dealership. So it just really creates a whole culture from uh, from the phone call all the way through the repair order or through the sales transaction where the customer feels like they're in the know and that they've talked to people along the way that are very knowledgeable and very, uh, you know, very personable and that they they're very excited about what they do. You know, Sarah, I think what you shared was even a, a, another example of exactly what Adam was saying. When people understand how their role contributes to the bigger picture they're going to perform at a higher level. They're going to make it more impactful. And ultimately, it helps the entire team. Shauna, um, can I ask if you could share a, another example of a win-win um, that's happened in one of the dealerships that you've been a part of? Fortunately, we're part of Carter Myers Automotive, which uh, all of our employees are owners. And it really changes the dynamic. Uh, people really are tied to their jobs. They have a sense of pride that I've never seen before, which is really great. But we also have to have a little bit of fun. And I think we've gotten stuck over the years of thinking everyone's motivated by the same thing and it's money, but it's not money. Um, it's very small amount of people that are really driven by money. If money were the case, then everybody would be a total high achiever. We've got to find out what makes everybody tick. So over my past month here, um, we've really been trying to get to know people and figuring out what it is that motivates them, what drives them, what gets them out of bed every day too, because everyone's different. Everyone's motivated differently. Uh, one of our exciting trips that we're taking, we're trying to get out of the classroom environment as much as we can and really have some real life experience. And something that's really near and dear to my heart is the customer experience um, and elevating that to a really special place that a lot of dealerships don't take it. Um, so we're actually taking our entire leadership team to the Ritz Carlton this weekend uh, to just really experience the way that they do things. It's Ritz Carlton's owned by the Marriott company. Um, the difference between staying at a Ritz Carlton and a courtyard are wildly different. Um, even though it's owned by the same company, it's still a completely different experience. So for them to be able to enjoy that and experience something maybe they haven't before, um, one of the big things that the Ritz Carlton preaches on is anticipation of needs. So sometimes we wait back for something to happen for us to react to it instead of seeing an opportunity to maybe make customers day and jumping on that before they maybe make a complaint or they voice a concern. So we're really excited about that. We've actually got the um, staff of the Ritz Carlton who's going to uh, speak to our group as well. So we're really uh, excited about that. And it's just a great way to get them included and take them out of that classroom environment and really give them a real life application that they can see outside of a dealership world and they can take back and apply with them. So even though technically you're part of our group, I didn't know you all were doing this this weekend. So I might have to get an invite. <laughs> You have one more room left. You're welcome to come. So a win that they get that experience as well as a new learning environment that will also help grow our customer experience. Heidi, could you share something that you've experienced at Group One um, that has been a win-win in your growth with their organization? Yeah. So with uh, us here at the dealership, we often um, have panels at least once a month. Um, and these panels will go over customers, concerns, reviews. It's not just directors, managers in these panels. Um, the service advisors, sales associates are included. And we get to give our input and um, kind of uh, speak about what things could have been done better or um, share about good experiences we've had. Um, what works well for us and um, bounce back ideas. Um, and then uh, a lot of the times our, um, well, pre-pandemic, we do outings. So 
at least every month or two, we like to go have uh, dinner. We've done top golf. Uh, we go to lunches and um, really just keep um, everybody engaged with each other. That's been and, tough uh, during COVID. You know, yeah. a lot of the stuff that we did to create good cultures in our dealerships yeah. have been challenged over the last six months. Um, I'm going to pivot to the next question. I'm just going to get two of you all to jump in on this one. And that's talking about how a diverse team in our dealership, that means diversity of gender, of race, of ages. And what I always say, it's really diversity of ideas is what we're looking for. And we know that when we create a diverse team, it's a win for our customers, it's a win for our associates, and it's a win for uh, the company as a whole. So I'd like to ask a couple of you to share one strategy that you've implemented to recruit, hire, and retain a more diverse team in your parts and service department specifically. And the reason I'm gonna go to Adam first is because we oftentimes have a lot of women talking about this subject. But we also know that the only way we're gonna make inroads in creating, especially on the gender side of this, more diversity in our fixed ops departments is if men are a really important part of the equation. And Adam, I know you've done some, some really uh, progressive uh, things in your dealership groups. Could you share a little bit with us? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep it to one or two, let's say. Um, first of all, it starts out with a, a really important word and that's intentional. So when you're out there recruiting and or looking, you have to use an opener like women and men who, with military background, right? If that's what you're looking for, that's fine. So it starts by saying, okay, what is it that you're looking for characteristically? And I call it ETFM. We're looking for people who are enthusiastic, including for the parts department, trustworthy, friendly with a motor that runs high, or you can get rid of my ETFM and call it the golden retriever. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for somebody who's like that golden retriever. And that comes in women and men. So sometimes you have to physically do some things. So intentionally, when we built our facilities, we put a shower in the women's locker room. And that, when I talk to the people that build dealerships, that is unusual. But Nat says, no, we're open for women to be technicians. Um, and, and we've been able to recruit female technicians. And just to try to keep this a little bit brief, if you wanna go a little bit further into this, go up to your tech schools, and say, what we'd like to do is scholarship every female that enrolls on their second, third, and fourth semesters, if it's a four semester program, at $500. Um, and so you, we go all the way to the first semester, but a lot of people don't go from the first to the second. So um, somebody else is, uh, one of my stores has said, you know, we're just gonna start in the second semester. Now we're on the top of the list when it comes time for placement as well. So we have a career path for everybody. You need to have a career path that allows you to recruit characteristics rather than skill sets. And then you develop skill sets along the way. So for every every position in our store, we've created a career path um, that leads to service, service BDC, service advisor to from um, entry level tech, from Porter to entry level tech to uh, full, fully master tech, uh, from uh, reception to BDC or to sales or into the office. So all of that in a holistic way is say, A, do it intentionally, go find people who are diverse, make sure that, that the people in your organization understand that we are going to build a diverse staff and hear them out when they, when they give you your, their concerns. You'll be surprised by what you hear. We did this a few years ago and it's really changed our organization. Sarah, would you like to jump in and, and share uh, anything you've seen at Scott Clark where you all have made inroads in recruiting a diverse work team? Work team. It could be gender, race, uh, diversity of ideas in any space. I'd be happy to chime in on that. So we launched a program actually last year where we really were deliberate in our recruiting and hiring efforts with the larger community. One of the big things that we did is we highlighted individuals within our organization and showed the career progression. You know, we had all these different employees within our auto group. Um, myself, I was included in that, but we had people from our rental car department, people from finance, uh, people from sales. And what we did is we, we actually interviewed them and talked about specifically how they've developed in the Scott Clark auto group. Uh, several of us, you know, have come from other automotive organizations. Some of us have come from, you know, just straight out of college or straight out of high school and took a job, you know, as a porter or, uh, or moving cars. And now they're the assistant service manager for the whole dealership. 
Um, and so just highlighting some of those stories, it really uh, draws in the community as well. And that's something that, that I've done personally when I recruit for my department, I have relationships with our local colleges. And I myself, when I was looking for my career to start after I got out of college, you know, the perfect uh, scenario for me at the time was I was hoping to get into museum curation and, and work in kind of the antiquities arena. Well, uh, I came out right when the economy was not so good. So those jobs were very limited. And, and as a result, I became, you know, very resourceful and kind of looking around and just happened to get into the automotive industry. But I fell in love with it. And I've, I wouldn't imagine going to anything else now, you know, 11 years later. But the thing that, that I've had a lot of success with is talking to college students, talking to the recruit, um, to the career center, and just bringing awareness. Because even at the colleges, a lot of times when a student approaches the career center and says, you know, I, I'm interested in pursuing finance or I'm interested in pursuing this degree. A lot of times the college world will say, all right, well, then you need to get into the banking industry or you need to get into this very specific niche. And oftentimes the automotive industry is completely excluded from that advice. And so just being able to have that conversation with people and say, look, you know, if you're interested in a career in finance and that's something that you want to pursue, let's talk about the finance department within a dealership. Let me make you aware about, you know, the career options that you may not be aware of. And so I've had a lot of different people uh, from very different backgrounds uh, come into the dealership in different roles uh, within my department and also within other departments that probably wouldn't have considered it uh, had they not been brought, uh, you know, more awareness uh, had been brought forth to them. You're absolutely right. And um, something that we talk about all the time, we've got to be intentional. We've got to be out there sharing our story. We've got to be having these conversations because people are not putting the auto industry on their list of careers. And um, we just aren't, we aren't on their shopping list per se for a career. So um, next question is about technology. During COVID, uh, we've had a lot of changes happen in our industry. And uh, most dealerships have invested a lot of technology in our sales departments. We've done a lot of home and remote deliveries, paperless deliveries, virtual test drives, walk arounds. But we've also made some progress finally, I feel like, in our fixed operations. I'm curious if a couple of you could share one area where technology has created a win win for your dealership and for the customer during their service experience. Um, why don't we start with Heidi? And if you could uh, share a little bit about what Group One is doing in the area of technology for your service departments. So aside from the virtual walk around, um, right now we're using a lot of valet services. We're bringing customers' cars in, sending them links to view any reports of um, anything that we find concerning on their vehicle, where they could also uh, view you know, the multi-point inspection. Um, but additionally, now we have the technology to add images to these reports, tech, um, the technicians can send and customers can review. And recently now uh, technicians, they have mobile devices where they can upload videos to better um, show anything concerning that a customer might be needing to see on their vehicle. Um, when the process is over, we now have the technology to be able to send links directly to a customer's uh, email or cell phone where they can uh, pay and sign and then we can deliver the vehicle back to them. So definitely a lot of advancements prior and even more now that we're amidst a pandemic. Homes I would love to ask you, um, I think some of the areas that Heidi just shared, uh, we've probably all implemented in different um, we're probably in different uh, areas of, enro of uh, enrollment of all of these different pieces of technology. What I've seen and experienced is that is, these are great wins for the customer. We've definitely had some pushbacks in our shop from some of the technicians as far as the type of technology they're comfortable using. Is it slowing them down? How do we make it well integrated with everything else they're doing? Um, could anyone else share a couple of ideas on how the technicians in particular have embraced technology and how we can move this forward faster? Shauna, go ahead and go over to Sarah. 
Yeah, of course. Um, I think one of the biggest things that we do is we ask technicians to use new technology and maybe it's something they haven't used before. And that role has evolved so much in the past few years. Um, but also tying back their numbers when they, you know, instead of just saying, hey, I need you to do a video MPI or I need you to do all these extra steps, but tying it back into what's making them more successful than they were year over year. Um, the amount of approvals that they're getting on that text message MPI coming through to a cell phone. Um, you know, we don't really even have to call the customer to get them to approve everything. So they can do it from the convenience of their home. They can send it to a friend to double check things for them. I mean, it just makes it so much more comfortable for the customer to really um, choose what they want for their vehicle. So for the technician to see that, hey, my numbers are actually increasing and it's making a difference in my paycheck and it's also making my job a little bit more simple. We get faster um, turnaround time on a video MPI or on a digital MPI than calling the customer, hoping they call us back and then we've got the car up on a lift. You know, what if we can get all those approvals while the car's still in the lift in the shop? And it's a lot faster for them. So it's finding those benefits and tying it back into what we've asked. That's exactly right. We know it's a win-win. The technicians may not always see it until we can make sure we tie it to what the result is that they're going to see, whether it be on their paycheck or just from a more efficient and uh, productive day. Sarah, did you have a comment on the same subject? Yes. So we actually, right, um, right in COVID, we, we implemented a whole new software using X time for our lane and shop. And we actually made a big change that has been uh, X time we've been utilizing for our scheduler and, and our business development center. Uh, but we didn't have really the, the software tying all the way through into the lane and into the shop. And so we made a pretty radical change with that. And there was some concern initially from the technicians that you know, having this would slow, slow them down, having to learn a new platform. But what we found with the with X time and one of the reasons why we chose to go to it was because there's a lot more integration across the entire uh, entire platform from the moment we schedule a service appointment to when the technician is completing the MPI and making the recommendations. Um, it just has streamlined a lot of what our store's pain points were prior to COVID. And one of the other things that's been really nice about it is we've 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 cut down a lot of calls where customers were checking on the status of a vehicle. And one of the great things that X-Time has, it's almost like if you order a pizza from Domino's and you want to check on the status of your pizza and see like where it is in the world, that same technology exists for the customer next time. So it's really nice that a customer instead can just click the link, view what the status of their car is, uh, and have that communication with the advisor. Uh, and, and then also the advisor can see what the technician recommends. And, and everybody has that transparency now. So I think that's been something that we initially were, uh, you know, had some concerns in our shop, certainly, where there was a concern that, oh gosh, we're going to launch into a new technology right in the middle of all this. Uh, but our what we found is that all of our stores have really embraced it. And we've been much more efficient with it. There's no doubt that that it is a true win-win for us to bring technology into our service departments. And uh, in some ways, we've got to thank COVID for doing everything from helping to push us, as Heidi said, on pickup and drop off for service. Uh, to utilizing more video and text to be able to communicate with our customers. I, I expect all of us are going to get just better and better with this over the next year. And within a couple years, we're not even going to remember the old way of doing business. So uh, I know I'm excited about it. I think our team is excited about it too, Sarah. Just a few bumps in the road to get us there for sure. All right, we're going to go into our lightning round, which is how we're going to finish up this panel today. And uh, what I want each of you to answer in, in about a, a minute or less is what is one thing that we need to evolve or change in our fixed operations department to create such a win for customers over the next five years that they remain loyal to the franchise dealership and not migrate to an independent shop as their vehicle ages. Give us something concrete, something exciting that you see that we need to change. And uh, Shauna, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Heidi made a really great point earlier about using the technology. And I think that, you know, I've surveyed people and asked, what makes you take your deal, your vehicle to an independent shop versus bringing it back to the franchise dealer? And it's, it takes too long and I don't trust them. Um, so using technology, we can overcome all of those things. We can uh, use video MPIs. We can send everything to their phone. We can make it super easy. Um, we can also make it transparent too. And transparency is huge. So for us to be able to send all of that to them and they have that trust and they can see even 
you know, Heidi could send a video of her face explaining exactly what's going on with their vehicle. Um, they can see the vehicle. They can see that their tires are low instead of someone calling them. And maybe they make that phone call to somebody saying, hey, did, have you seen my tires lately? Do they look low? We can show them they are. The tread depth is uh, in a dangerous position. So we have all the capabilities now. Um, it's really just us using it to make everything transparent and simple for our consumers. Thanks, Shauna. Sarah, over to you. Shauna's point is spot on, and I'll just add to add to that. Communication is really important to customers, and especially, you know, we've seen that with COVID. People are, are uncomfortable if they feel like they don't know what's going on with the process. And so if we can minimize the points where a customer is uninformed or feels that they're uninformed, that's going to help us build that relationship of trust and have them come back to us versus the independents. That's been one way that the, our business development center has maintained so much business for us during this time is that we've actually had customers call us back and say, you know, I called you earlier today specifically because I know I need tires and I needed to get a price on them. Not only did y'all give me the price, but you also emailed me a breakdown of what the warranty was, what the, you know, what the, the information about the specific tire was. When I tried to call Tire Kingdom or I tried to call this other independent place, I got some guy on the phone that just told me a flat price and then they never really got back to me about it. So I'm choosing to go to you because I feel comfortable with the communication I received. And so having the technology, uh, like Shauna said, that's a key component to aid in that communication for sure. All right, Heidi, we've got one minute. What's one thing we need to evolve or change in our fixed operations over the next five years to create that win for the customers? So definitely build that relationship, build rapport with your customers early on. Let them know that you care about them. Thank them for their business. And, you know, in the end, um, there are mature vehicle programs too. Um, send them uh, event notices. Um, and with those events, we do giveaways, small giveaways, just to bring them in and for a token of appreciation for their business. All right, Adam, finish this up with some fire. What do you have? What do we need to change in the next five years? Okay, well, I'm going to give you a, a quick one that everybody can do. Um, and if you do, it will work to start people down the lo loyalty superhighway. And that is to hold technology meetings for new owners in your dealership. So if you wanted to right now, ask your customers if they knew how to use their car, they would say yes, but. Um, so we've held, held technology events. You can do that during COVID. Uh, please understand that your technicians need to stay, that your advisors need to stay, and that you need to be at one-on-one. -on -one. So don't fill the room with 200 people. But if you do that for a group of people that own specific models, people will attend a technology um, seminar. Um, and that will also give you an opportunity after the sale of the vehicle to create that loyalty, lay out what the expectations are. And then I'm gonna throw a second thing real quick, and that is hire your future. When you bring somebody in to work express service, if you want to be female, if you want to be a diverse culture, if you want to have somebody who's in a wheelchair in the future, then bring them in at that spot and create the staff that you're going to have in the future. But if they're not nice people, don't hire them because in the future, People only want to communicate like they did in the past with people that they like. Thank you so much, Adam, Sarah, Shauna, Heidi. I really have appreciated your inputs. I was over here taking a few notes myself, and I think I need to turn it over to Ted and Jean because we are about out of time. Great job, everyone. You know, and, and tremendous reminder, Adam. You know, from some of the things that I heard, Shauna, on this on this panel, that we're not just in the car business; we're we're really in the people business, and we always have to remember that. So. Uh, Sarah Van Tyne, thank you so much. Heidi, uh, Adam, Shauna, and of course, Liza Borges, great work today. We appreciate it so much. And remember, the focus, everybody, on customer retention carries through the, the balance of the day. So very honored to have you all here today. Thanks, everybody. And Ted, several of the folks on this panel have an opportunity to win an award today. Tell us a little bit more about that. That's right. At each of the roundtables, we have a best practice award. And that's awarded to five of the best presenters uh, in the 
view of our audience. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to put up a QR code on the screen, everybody. And if you would, you could take your phones. We'll start early voting. We'll announce the winners today at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. But go ahead and open your camera on your phones. You can scan the QR code right now, and you can go ahead and vote for the, the person who you felt did the best job here today. Uh, two of the people who are on here are previous recipients of the Best Practice Award, Liza Borges and Sarah Van Tyne. So we don't have them included here. But again, you can vote for our panelists here today. And uh, you can do that throughout the day, and we'll announce the, the winners of the Best Practice Award at 5.30 p.m. Eastern, Gene. Well, Ted, we're now going to a panel from win-win to really the theme of our event, which is the Tire Summit. That's right, Gene. Uh, we're so fortunate to be joined today by Dave Boyle, who is the CEO of Tire Profiles in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for being instrumental in putting this whole thing together with our focus on tires and customer retention. So we can't thank you enough. Welcome back to the Fix Ops Roundtable. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate it. It's, uh, boy, it's been a fun ride. I'm so glad that we're doing this one just on tires. It's uh, obviously the business that I'm in and I'm excited about it. And I'm really excited to, to host this panel um, I can't tell you guys how honored I am to to get to listen to these guys. I've got, uh, you may see my head moving around a little bit here because I've got a notebook set up here and I've got a pen ready because I plan to take some notes because uh, I don't know everything about this business and I plan on learning from these guys. So let me just take a couple of seconds before we get started and introduce everybody around the panel because boy, we have some distinguished folks with us today. Uh, first, we've got Mr. Chuck Kramer, the COO of the Foundation Auto Group. Chuck, it's your first time participating in this. So glad to have you with us. Brings a lot of experience uh, to this. Tom Drzinski, the Director of Service Operations for the West Toronto Group is with us. He's been with us once before. Tom, great to see you again. Another first time participator, really happy to have this guy. He's a good friend of mine personally. Mr. James Friel, the Service Director from the Crest Auto Group, part of Berkshire Hathaway Automotive. Uh, James, welcome. Adam Perlow is with us, has been with us before, the EVP, Executive Vice President of the Island Auto Group um, in New York. And last but certainly not least, we've got Mr. Tully Williams, the Fixed, Operator, fixed Operations Director from the Nilo Group. Guys, why don't you all unmute your microphones and uh, let me give you one more welcome to the, uh, to the panel. As I said, it's really great to have you guys with us. Um, as I said, I'm personally really excited about doing this panel and, and hearing what you guys have to, you know, have to say. You know, today we're, we're talking about tires and, and this is the Tire Summit. Um, and it's been the business that I've been in for the past 10 years. Uh, so as I said, I'm, I'm especially excited about this whole format and hearing what you guys have to say. And specifically this panel, I want to focus on the, the link between tires and retention, because that's really what I'm all, all about with my business and my company. And, and we all know that that, that keeping that customer, getting that tire, specifically that first tire sale is so critical to long-term retention and all the other stuff that comes along with that. And I'm really excited to get your guys' take on this. Uh, so let's let's jump right into this. So I've got a couple of questions I'm gonna pose and we're gonna do a little bit of different format here for each question. This, this first question I'm gonna pose here, I'm gonna give each of you a couple of minutes to answer. Uh, and we're gonna start with you, Chuck, if that's all right. And then we'll kind of yeah, go around the board. We'll go around the board and um, I'm gonna, I'll try to give you guys some hand signals when we're getting close to running out of time on your two minutes because we do wanna try to stay on topic here, if we, on time I should say if we can. So here's the question that I've got first and, and, and it's this, industry data shows that dealers have roughly around a nine, eight to 9% 9 share of the overall tire replacement market. Effectively dealers lose 90 plus percent of the tire business to the aftermarket today. If you had to pick one thing out of all the things in your in your dealerships that you think would have the biggest impact on reversing this trend, what would it be? You know, and, and thank you for inviting me, uh, David. I, I I think you know my experience has been is uh, I think it's it's comes down to training and process, and I said setting an expectation and everybody understanding from the top down the buy in. That why, why are we doing this? And, 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 and I think that it's hard to pick one thing, but two things that I would say is the, is the process, the buy-in, uh, the training, um, actually having the guys on the front line when they do the multi-point inspection, when the customer comes into the service drive, they, ba they basically need to be prepared. So it takes a little bit of training 
and a little bit of research uh, and technology is in, in today's world. Technology is extremely important. Customers are a little bit different. I mean, when they go into some of the service drives, you know, most of the time they really don't expect expect to spend money. In some cases, unless you know, I had a couple of uh, Ford Quick Lane Tired Auto Centers. Those guys expect to spend spend money, but I'm mostly on a service drive and, and traditional uh, dealership. You know, you got to be prepared. You got to you got to have those guys prepared. So when they go out there and greet, meet that customer, do the training. Uh, work on the multi-point inspection, inspection, have a process to make sure that makes it, you know, pretty seamless. And then technology is important. Like, you know, uh, you know, you can do the handheld, you know, trep, uh, depth, tread depth uh, indicators and just, just understanding, you know, when the customer comes in, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to measure this and then give them reasons to buy. And I think it's extremely important, the training process and then obviously having some technology there to, to be a part of that, that whole tower process at the meet and greet. It's interesting that I uh, love that. It's interesting that the quick lane is viewed more as a tire place than a dealer, right? And that's, I think, part of the problem is that the customer doesn't view, you know, dealerships as their tire shops in many cases. And that's, I think, one of the one of the one of the the, the things we need to change. Yeah, and again, I was very instrumental when when I in 2008 when we went through the downturn. You know, I'm a sales guy. 35 years, I started selling cars. Fix stops was you know, fix stops was we had to have the service department just because we have a franchise. And when we when we when we had so our dealerships were so heavily weighted on on selling cars, we better find an alternative way to make money. And I think that I think your biggest defection rate of a customer leaving a dealership after they buy a car is because of of maintenance. So I was very instrumental working with uh, Ford Motor Company and. And uh, in 2009, 2010, with a guy named Don Cape, um, Chris Norton uh, did the presentation to Alan Mullally, and I had the first uh, quick lane tire and auto center. And the reason I did that is because it seemed like the service bays were full of service work, uh, recalls and warranty work. And, and, and that was the main focus. So but I think that if you go back and look, one of the biggest profit centers in, the in my dealership was the back then was the tire and auto center. I think tires was our number one focus to hook customer on a retention. Right. The profit margin really wasn't there. You know, the guy's dealer would tell me the dealer, my partner at the time says, we only make $50 on a tire. But I said, look at the total ticket. It was a $400 ticket right. on top of the tire sale. So, right. you know, it's, it's the, it's, everything's changed and switched. And that's why I think a lot of dealerships, you know, are changing or going out of business or selling is because ultimately they don't have those processes and procedures in place. And that's one of the things that our company has been doing is acquiring dealerships, putting these processes in place and focusing on, you know, I'd say the touch point items that to me basically retain the customer to the dealership. Right. Yep. Nope. Love it. Mr. Friel, you want to take a whack at this? Sure. Um, thanks, Dave, for having me. And, and guys, thanks for having me on the, the uh, broadcast today. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I think we need to consistently report the tire conditions um, or concerns to our customers on every service visit. Uh, thing I found is that customers will not buy if they're not aware of those are concerned. Uh, we have to have a good process of collecting the specs and conveniently getting that to our service consultants. Uh, in our case, we use uh, technology to get this information as easily as possible. And, and Dave, here's a plug for you. In our case, we use TreadSpec. Um, been using it for, uh, oh, a little over a year. We used the group glove before that for several years. Uh, this product gives my consultant easy or consultants easy web-based access to the uh, tire and alignment information they need to educate our customers. Our customers also receive a text with the same information immediately after they arrive on our service drive. And uh, in my opinion, this texting uh, adds credibility to my consultant's recommendations when the tires, rotations, or alignments are needed. Um, my opinion, with a little technology and a little process management, we can shorten that gap between the uh, aftermarket world and ours. I want to make sure that everyone knows that I didn't pay him to say that. In fact, he's paying me. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Mr. Adam Perlow. Good to be with Great you, Dave. Good to be with you, buddy. What do you say about this? Well, um, for us here at Island Auto Group, we use technology. And um, really, when I when I joined the group about four and a half years ago, uh, the group was not using technology, waiting for the technicians to take the measurements. And by the time the information got to the customers, it was a little too late, uh, lost the, the punch of presentation. And, um, and there just wasn't, in my opinion, enough credibility in the presentation. So I went out and, and, and candidly looked at all the technology out there. Uh, it, in the end, it just so happens 
uh, that I did choose tire profiles, tread spec machines from your I, company. I honestly didn't set this up this way, guys. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but, but to be fair, just, you know, my message to everybody is, listen, Dave, there are many competitors uh, to your equipment. That's, that's a fact. The first piece is acknowledging you need a piece of equipment to take those tread specs when the car comes into the shop so that you immediately have a credible printout showing the tread depths of the tires uh, because customers like to see a printout or a text. They like to see something other than our people telling them you need this because. So uh, when we installed the equipment, what we found was the following. Um, at our particular dealerships, because we have such a high lease penetration, the highest in the country at 85% and we're on an island, uh, so our customers are only driving about 9,000 miles a year, they're not going through tires at the normal rate as our dealerships are that we own in New Jersey. Uh, but what we do is we take those, those tread depths that get printed on the sheet along with whether it needs an alignment or a rotation, and we show the customer the health of their tires every time they come in. So even if we're not selling them a tire that day, when it's time to sell them an alignment, and with all the potholes in New York, they need a lot of alignments uh, and rotations, uh, we have more credibility because we're showing them, you may not need tires today, but you might a few months from now. And that has helped us quadruple our alignment seals and our rotation seals. And um, when it comes to tires, uh, the tires that we are selling, there's no question we're selling because we're using technology to quickly identify if the customer needs the tires and to show them their tread depths from a computerized printout using a tread spec machine. So my, my, my summation is that uh, whatever machine you use, you need a piece of technology like a tread spec that uh, measures the tread depths instantly so that there can be an instant conversation with the customer and credibility. I think that, you know, the, the, I, what I liked about what you said was the fact that, you know, you and I have talked about this before, Adam, you have a unique situation there with low miles and lots of leased cars. And you do a lot of time basically selling nothing, but you're still talking about tires. And that to me is a key piece to this, right? Because we have a bad habit in this industry of only talking about things when there's time to sell something. And that hurts credibility. You know, when our consumers start to use the word upsell, they know it <laughs> because they feel it. That's not necessarily a good thing. And I love the fact that your approach has always been, you know, we're going to start talking about the green tires and we're going to talk about the green tires for maybe a couple of years in some cases um, and then segue into yellow and then eventually red um, for the uh, for the, the, the ones that need it. So I think that's a key, key piece to this. So appreciate that. Thank you, sir. And again, I did not pay him for the plug. I just want to make sure I'm clear on that. Absolutely true. He's, again, he's paying me for my services. So Tom Drzinski, over to you, sir. What do you say about this? Well, I, I got to say, uh, number one, thanks. Thanks for having me here uh, this afternoon. Um, I, I love what I've heard so far. Uh, for, for me, I, I think my answer is going to kind of en encompass a, a few other things. And my answer is be in the tire business. Make the determination that you are in the tire business. Um, and that's going to come from as simple as keeping the right supply of tires, working with either your OEM partners or your local tire distributors to determine what tires you need to keep in stock, have the right number, uh, make sure you have deliveries set up. Um, if you're only keeping a couple sets, four sets on hand, what, you know, what are you going to do? You can't take care of your customers when you're in there. Um, looking at every single vehicle, as, as you've heard, has been kind of common across here. If you're not checking the tire, the, the, the tire treads, um, if you're not checking the tread depths and the condition um, right away, that, that's a problem. You need to tell people that you sell tires. You need to have displays set up in your, in your area. You know, if you, if you go to one of those aftermarket tire shops, there are tires everywhere. You know, they tell you as soon as you walk in the door, everything about that place screams, we sell tires. And then you walk into so many service drives and it's bare. There's this empty space. You know, there, there's so many, so many spots. Your, your tire distributors will be more than happy to work with you to, to, to put some, um, some displays out there. Understand the pricing, understand your market, what your market can bear, do the research. Um, and, and finally, use your, your tools. So many of the manufacturers, you know, you've, you've got quick lanes associated with Ford. Quicklane does price match. If you're not maximizing that price match every chance that you get, you're missing so many opportunities. Uh, we're, we're lucky enough across, you know, 20, 20 plus locations. Um, 
that we can shift if we have to. If I've got a customer where I can't make it work over here, that customer can go to our quick lane and I can do a price match and we can, we can make that happen. Um, really comes down to, again, making sure that you make a decision at, as a company that you are in the tire business and tell everybody that you're in the tire business. I, I, I agree with everything that you said, Tom. I think that it's a package, right? You got to do it all right if you're going to do this at all. Um, you can you can have you know even products like mine where you measure the tires. But as an example, if you're 40, 50 bucks more a tire than your next closest competitor, well, I mean, you're not going to sell a whole lot of tires. That's regardless of what you do from a process standpoint. If you don't have all the elements, you've got to market it. You've got to price them. You've got to have the tires in stock. You've got to you've got to have you know some way to present the the need as everybody else has said. But it's it really is a package, right? You got to have a little bit of everything. So, Mr. Tully Williams, last but certainly not least, sir, what you say about this? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say thank you again, uh, David, for the invite, and uh, I agree with these four gentlemen. But I think the key issue to tires is, and we're guilty as sin, is do your service advisors believe in tires? Do your service managers believe in tires. We can buy all the great products in the world. As you all know, there's a lot of products we buy that sit idle. And I think that if we don't have the service advisors understand that selling $4 trillion in tires and it makes me a buck is a good thing because we want to make sure that we are truly in the repeat and referral business. And if we don't sell tires, we are not truly in the repeat and referral business. And my challenge is today, and I'm telling you, I'm not that good at it. I mean, we are working hard on it is to convince my managers and our service advisors that tires drives repeat and referral business so we can get all the good stuff too. I think price is very little piece of it. If we build the trust and build that camaraderie with our customers, price will become obsolescence. It's, it's not a need as long as we're competitive. And I think that is our biggest, biggest challenge. You know, we are as good as our people and we need to get our people trained on the importance of tire sales. You know, it's interesting. Chuck Kramer and I had this conversation last night when we were catching up on the phone, you know, and he said this, this, the success here starts from the very top. You know, it, it takes the dealer, the GM has to commit to being in the tire business. If that doesn't happen, then it doesn't become part of your brand. It needs to be part of the dealership's brand. It needs to be, you know, everything that, that, that we do needs to have a tire component to it if you're going to be successful. So guys, great, great responses. I've, I've got notes here. I'm, I'm listening and taking notes and I think, I hope everybody else is as well. So fabulous responses to those, that first question. So second and last question here, and we're going to do this one a little bit different. I'm uh, I'm going to sort of split it up here. I'm going to ask the question, then I'm going to ask each one of you to sort of take a different component of it. So there was some research that was done that, that I was able to get uh, a copy of recently done by one of the largest tire manufacturers in the world. And it showed the three main consumer drivers for tire sales are price, convenience, and trust. And not in that order that necessarily, but those are the three main drivers. It's got to be competitively priced, it's got to be a convenient operation, and I need to trust the person that I'm buying from. So I would like each of you to take a couple of minutes um, and address one of these areas um, and tell me what your thoughts are. And Tom, we're going to start with you this time. Um, and you said to me that you'd like to talk about price. So talk to us about pricing, your pricing philosophy, and how do we make sure that we are priced properly to, to win the consumer? So thanks to, thanks to cell phones, I, I love them. Um, there's so much information right at our fingertips. You, you're really never going to have that price or product advantage again. You know, the tire that you're selling is the same tire that they can buy down the street. And while they're sitting in your waiting room, they can check your price across those others. So if you are not actively looking at your market and understanding what tires sell for, and you are continuing to price them like you would any other dealer level service, you're just going to be out of the game. You're going you're gonna to price yourself out. So there's a couple of different ways that I think you can you can keep those things in line. Number one, if you only partner with the with the supplier that your OEM recommends, you're going to consistently find yourself 10, 15, 20 percent above the above the, the market. Um, more than one supplier tends to keep the keep keep your suppliers honest. Um, understand that there are different places that you can buy tires. So leverage those tires, those those tire purchases, and and be be ready to stock tires. 
buy a larger amount of tires or be able to sell more tires. You can get them on consignment potentially. Um, but, but just working with one supplier for tires is going to be difficult, especially if it's only your, your partner OEM, because they're not always the, they're not always the, the lowest price, which then puts you at an, an immediate disadvantage. Um, but then understand your tools, the, the tools that you have, and make sure that your advisors, more than anything, are, are trained and bought in on the tools. Do they know the current rebates? And who is, who is um, responsible for making sure that your advisors know every month when those rebates change? Um, and then how about things like price match? You know, do, does your manufacturer offer price match? Do you have the ability to do that as a, as, a, as a group or as a dealer? Are you willing to take the hit on some sets in order to gain that business, knowing what it brings in the long, in the long run? Um, I'll, I'll take a loss on a set of tires if I know that they're not going to my competitor down the street and they're, and they're coming back. Um, you know, understand when, when manufacturers run the specials, like the buy three, get one, especially where the manufacturer matches or contributes. Um, you know, you, you got to be ready to move all in at those times. But really no, doing the work, understanding the market, making the phone calls, research, know what your tire sells for, know what, what, what it sells for across town, and, and then just understand where you want to be. Yeah, no, I think that uh, I had somebody tell me this a while ago and it stuck with me. It's a little bit like used car today, right? I mean, the used car game has changed today because, you know, finding out what that car sells for lots of different places is easy to do today with the internet. And being able to market price a used car, dealers have all in on that, right? This, you know, whether it's the uh, Viato or whatever, everybody's all in on making sure that we're properly market priced. And tires, in my opinion, are the same way when it comes to price. You've got to know, you don't have to be cheaper, but you at least need to know where you stand, right? Um, and, and if you're gonna if you're gonna be uh, if you're gonna be be competitive and and win that business, so good stuff, good stuff, Tom. I appreciate that, Mr. Friel. We're gonna turn to you next, and we're gonna I'm gonna ask you to talk about the trust piece, trust and and trust and transparency were the two things that that came across loud and clear in this research. So talk to us a little bit about what you do at Crest to help build trust with your with your customers. Well, I, I am in the luxury market, and I believe trust is the primary driver for uh, the decision making with my customer base. And uh, one of the ways of building trust is to provide feedback on the customer's uh, tire condition on every service visit they have with us. Um, this is, uh, again, where your tread spec comes in. We, we get reports every time a car comes across my service drive. Uh, even if my consultant misses getting the information to the customers, they're still receiving an easy to understand text the customer is that they can look at themselves to see the condition of their tires, alignment needs, uh, rotational needs, those type things. I want our customers to know that their tires are in good condition as much as when they need something or when they need a tire replacement or an alignment, sort of some things that uh, some of you guys have touched on. And I think by providing consistent feedback to our customers, they will be fully aware of their tire health and will not have any surprises when they do need tires. And uh, that, that goes along with the trust. we got to trust yep. that we're going to give yeah, them a fair exactly. price. Exactly. I too. think that uh, Jim knows this. Jim and I have talked about this for years. I have a saying that is sell the green. And, you know, you need to be selling from the green. And that's, you know, sell when there's nothing to sell. Uh, is the message. And that's what I think is one of the key foundational pieces to building that trust uh, over time is, you know, you're, you, you're more their advocate at that point, just not some guy trying to sell them something every time, which is right. so critical to this. So thank you, James. Appreciate that. Mr. Kramer, convenience. Let's talk about convenience for a bit. That's a big driver in this. And uh, if I, if I'm just going to peel the lid off of this, uh, it was, in fact, on this on this survey that they did, that was the number one thing, actually, was convenience. Well, and I, and I agree. And I, I think convenience was one of the things I looked at. Uh, I agree with Mr. Tully, uh, Tully that the fact of it is, is it starts at the top. And convenience and everything, it starts and set, set in the culture in your stores. I think a customer, when they come into to the dealership and, and, and you are you know, make, showing their, their tires and what's going on with their tires, that they need a set of tires. And then it's the convenience of, A, let's say, okay, I assess the issue. Uh, now I have a solution to the issue, but actually having the tires in stock or being available to, to get them. I had two tire and auto center stores and a big Ford store. And I can't tell you how many times we lost a sale when uh, we weren't able to get a, get a tire. And they said, oh, come back, you know, Tuesday 
or uh, next Wednesday, you, you, you need to have you need to have tires on hand you, uh, to 100 percent. If you're going to be if you're going to talk tires or you're going to be in a tire business, you better have tires. Then if you don't have the tires, you have you need to have the ability to have tires. And so when customers come in, you can lose the sale pretty quickly. Say, yeah, OK, I get it. They're not shopping you. Um, they're not so much focused on price because they they're there. They want to fix they want to fix the, the car, get new tires. But more importantly, they don't want to do it. They want to do it that time. And then then I think the most important thing, as you talk about convenience of it is, is it's just like when the pandemic hit in March. First thing we did have 19 dealerships. We said protect cash. So so a lot of these customers will say, well, I really can't afford it. Or I really don't want to spend my money. I'm not sure of the future. Not sure what's going to go on. So you got to have a finance source for these tires. You got to have an, the ability not only to uh, assess the problem, Here's the solution to the problem. And I agree, I'm a big Ford guy. So price match was my big deal, right? And, and I was the chairman of the board for the quick, time, quick Lane Tire and Auto Center. And I brought up in Houston, we brought up the buy three, get one free, was the biggest tire event the Ford dealerships ever had. We sold more tires than any other time in, in that period of time, six week period of time, almost the whole year. But what we did, we had solutions. We had tires on hand. We had a process in place. We were committed from the top. And then most importantly, we had an opportunity to finance that tire. If, if you don't have a finance solution, meaning if you got a quick way of doing it, two to three minutes, being able to go on an app, get, get a approval for the tires, you're going to lose 30, 40 percent of your tire sales, no matter how great you are. And, and, and again, I, I, the luxury area, we have luxury stores and it's a little bit different. But when you go down to the bread and butter cars, you go to Kia, Hyundai. Ford, Dodge, Chrysler, Jeep, Ram, the GM stores that we have. I'm going to tell you, I mean, people every time they, hey, I'd love to have a set of tires, but my my local tire stores, they have opportunities for finance solutions. And I think uh, convenience has to be um, almost number, it has to be number one, or you're just going to lose tire sales, no matter how great you are on a service drive. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right, Tully, over to you. Um, I think you said you want to talk a little bit about trust. Yes, I think so. I mean, a little bit like what James said is uh, we are also in the luxury business. I think trust is a huge piece of our puzzle with our luxury brands. If it's a Porsche or a Volvo or a BMW, I think our customers demand that trust. And as we build those great relationships with our service advisors, as we try, we want to teach from the top down, is that building that relationship in the driveway from the day of the sell is so critical for us to get that repeat and referral business. And it rolls back to what well, all these gentlemen have talked about is that if we are selling the green, David, spot on, are we going over those key inspection issues? Because you figure out, I think there's four defection points in the driveway, maintenance, tires, batteries, right? And here's the problem. They're going to go somewhere else if it's red. And we want to make sure that we are going after that business, but we have to do it with the right way. We have to show the customer that we are their advocate. We have to show the customer that we believe in them, not us. And it starts with training our advisors to think that way. You know, we have a really good retention rate. We feel at Danilo company and we're so grateful and our customer satisfaction is high, but we still are not getting all the tire business because we don't believe in the tire business. And again, it starts from the top down. I believe if it, the GM is not in the tire business, you're not in the tire business. If your service manager is not in the tire business, you are not in the tire business. If your parts manager is not in the tire business, you're not in the tire business. So I believe having that trust from the top down and having that education from the top with the general manager, service manager, and your service advisor. I think Chuck spot on, why is Ford so successful? Because they teach and train tires every day. My previous employer, we had a Ford store. The tire guy came by at least twice a month. And here's the deal. If you're not in the tire business, he's gonna poke you until you get in the tire business. And right. God bless America that they did. Right, right. Fantastic, fantastic, Tully. Can't, uh, can't agree with more with anything you've said here. We have, Adam, we have exactly one minute left. I hate to do this to you, um, but we've got one minute left um, to talk about price. Give us, give us your one minute pitch on price. Sure, I'll take the minute. And I, I do have to say that I completely agree with Chuck about having a finance source. I'm actually interviewing a few this afternoon for customers that want to buy the tires and services, but can't afford it on the spot. And I see it as a huge opportunity. In regards to price, in our market, we're littered 
with non-branded mechanic shops, hundreds of them all over the place, and customers are constantly price shopping us. So what I tell my managers is, look, we know there's not great margins on tires. It's a commodity piece of the business. Let's give them the most competitive price, get them in, let them know we have full credibility, and then sell them the $150 alignment and sell them the rotation and sell them the brake work and get those tires off and look for the suspension work and not try to make huge hits every time, but keep them coming back over and over and over and building that life cycle. Fantastic. And using tires great way get. great way to end this That's guys listen post. um i know i gotta turn it back over to gene and ted here but before i do gentlemen thank you um this was quite an honor to talk to all of you guys some friends old friends newly new new, new friends and uh i really appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedule to do this with me today uh i've taken a page of notes here um i love it uh, i love to learn something new about this business every day guys so again uh appreciate it very much and ted gene back over to you guys Dave Boyle from Tire Profiles, thank you so much. You've got some of the greats, the giants in our industry here on this panel today. I want to thank Tully Williams. I want to thank James Friel, Chuck Kramer, uh, Tom Drzinski, and Adam Perlow. Thank you so much, everyone, for your contributions. I took a lot of notes, Dave. Great job.